Go. Um, this lecture is on the subject of unjustified enrichment. A person can be said to be unjustifiably enriched at another's expense when he has become owner of somebody else's money or property or used that property or has otherwise benefited, benefited from his actings or expenditure in circumstances which the law regards as actionably unjust and so requires the enrichment to be reversed. Now the obligation which arises from this state of affairs does not arise by way of consensual agreement, but rather by operation of law, as is the case in the law of dealing. Now at present in Scots law, an enrichment at another's expense is unjustified and should be reversed if its retention is supported by no legal ground. Now in the case of Shilladay against Smith, Lord Roger stated that a person may be said to be unjustly enriched at another's expense when he has obtained a benefit from the other's actings or expenditure without there being a legal ground which would justify him in retaining that benefit. The significance of one person being unjustly enriched at the expense of another is that in general terms it constitutes an event which triggers a right in that other person to have the enrichment reversed. Now in Dollar Land Cumbernauld Limited against CIN Properties Limited in 1999 set out the, fo the, the following um, elements were actually set out. Um, in a clause of action in unjustified enrichment. One, there is enrichment of the defender. Secondly, the enrichment is at the pursuer's expense. Thirdly, there is no legal justification for the enrichment. And fourthly and finally, it would be equitable and just to compel the defenders to redress the enrichment. Now, currently, as far as Scots law is concerned, an enrichment is said to be unjustified and therefore should be reversed if its retention is supported by no legal ground. Firstly, we've got to establish what is enrichment. Enrichment is the receipt or acquisition of a benefit of economic worth, leading either to an increase in the person's wealth or to the avoidance of loss of wealth. It can come about by receipt or acquisition of money. The majority of cases here concern the receipt or acquisition of money. I receive money which really I am not entitled to receive for any reason. Now a good example of this is Royal Bank of Scotland against Watt where W had a bank account with the Royal Bank of Scotland. W meets T in a pub. T possessed a cheque drawn an account of solicitor's firm, apparently for the amount of £18,000, Now, T wanted to cash the cheque, but told W he liked a bank account with which to do this, and W offered to help T. The cheque was paid into W's account at the RBS. W then withdrew the cash equivalent from the bank and gave that sum to T. W never saw T again. The cheque had originally been simply for £631, not £18,631. The cheque had been fraudulently altered. Since W had thus received cash from RBS, he was thus enriched at the bank's expense since the bank could not enforce the cheque against the solicitors. W was held liable to repay it the full amount. Again in Morgan, Morgan Garantry Trust Company of New York against Lothian Regional Council, which was decided in 1990. 
75. Our LRC, Lothian Regional Council, was a local authority and MG, a merchant bank. The parties had entered into a contract under which MG made payments to LRC which could be repaid in certain market conditions. It turned out that the contract was void. LRC had obtained money from MG without any legal basis for its retention. That is to say that LRC had money from MG without any legal basis for retention. In short, the authority was enriched at the bank's expense and it was found liable to repay the bank. Now, enrichment can also come about by receipt or acquisition of, another pro of the, another's property. The benefit can derive from other forms of property such as goods or corporeal movables, land or some incorporeal property right. A good example, an off-sighted example of the receipt of goods is seen in the case of Findlay against Monroe, which was decided in 1698. Here, F sent an ox to McFarlane. However, by mistake, the ox was delivered to M. M thought the ox was a gift from a friend. M killed the beast, salted the carcass for consumption. It was held that M was enriched by the receipt of the animal and was so liable. Enrichment can also come about by way of the acquisition of intangible benefits, such as the provision of a service which leaves no end product, such as the cleaning of a car, the, the rendering of other services. For example, in ELCAP versus Milne's Executor, 1999, M was an NHS patient receiving free care in hospital when it was taken over by charitable company E and became a nursing home. In patients who didn't require continuing uh, medical care were, were supposed to pay a charge to E. M was discharged as not requiring continuing uh, medical care. However, he continued to be cared for by E until his death three years later. M's curator Boris refused to pay the charges which were claimed by E. E's claim for recompense from M's estate for services was held to be relevant. Enrichment can also come about by the improvement of property. If it's improved in some way, by another, for example, a building is repaired or renovated or new buildings are erected, this would be a form of enrichment. For example, in Newton against Newton, decided in 1925, H bought a house in the name of his prospective wife, W, in which both parties lived until their marriage. H, in the belief that he owned the property, spent £400 on improving and repairing it. After the marriage broke down, it transpired that W was the owner of the house and was entitled to exclude H the husband from the house. It was held that W had been enriched by obtaining the benefit of H's, the husband's, improvements. Again, in Shilladay against Smith, 1998, M and W began to live together in M's cottage. They became engaged but never married. In 1988, M had brought a house in a state of disrepair and from about 1990 M and W began to improve the property into which they moved in 1991. The works were completed by Christmas of 1992 and that year M ejected W from the house. W had spent about £9,600 on works, 7000 direct to tradesmen whom she had instructed and about 1800 to M to pay for materials and work in the house and 756 on items for the garden which had been left behind after her ejection. M was found to be enriched by W's payments to him and also to the workmen which, were led, which had led to the renovation of his property and also by the items which she had left in the garden.
starten. Enrichment can also arise through the unauthorised use of another's property. In The Earl of Fife against Wilson, 1867, W had possession of land under lease which was found to be invalid against F, the heir of entail in the land. W was held to be enriched by his possession. In the modern case of G W G T W Holdings Limited against Toot, 1994, T occupied land which was owned by G T W for five years without any title to do so and without the owners knowing of the occupation. T was held to have been enriched to the extent of the annual worth of the land over the period. Enrichment can also arise where the owner allows another to occupy land where the relevant occupation was not intended to be gratuitous. For example, in Glen against Roy, which was decided in 1882, a father consented to his son's possession of a house without putting a formal lease in place. The son was found liable to pay for the enrichment which arose from the occupation, it being shown that the father had no intention to make a gift to the son. In Shetland's Islands Council against BP Petroleum, decided in 1990, Shetland Council allowed BP to occupy land which it owned in order to construct an oil terminal, Sullum Vaux. For several years, the parties negotiated a lease of the land while BP was conducting operations from the site. However, the negotiations were unsuccessful. It was held that BP could be made liable to the extent of the annual worth of the land. Again, in Rochester Poster Services Limited against AG Barr, 1994, AG Barr, um, leased and advertised a board site in Glasgow from RPS. The lease expired at the end of 1992 and negotiations for its renewal were unsuccessful. AGB, however, continued to advertise at the site for 18 months after the expiry of the lease. It was held that AGB was enriched to the extent of the annual worth of the site over the 17-month period. Now, an, the enrichment by the use of another's property can be extended to the use of movable property. The types of enriching, however, can be quite varied. The possessor may make a profit by reselling movable movables to a third party, or the possessor may make, make, a, may make a profit by reselling the movable to a third property, and the possessor may also destroy the property. Now, in Jarvis against Manson, which was decided in 1954, jewellers bought for £3, renovated, polished at a cost of £1.50, and resold for £10 a ring. The ring, worth £30, had been stolen, however. It was held that the jewellers were liable to the true owner to the extent of their enrichment. Now, Basically, we've got a number of cases which concern the performance of another's obligation. Now, this constitutes a grey area of law. What we consider here is a situation where the pursuer pays or performs to a creditor, C, the debt or obligation which is owed to C, the creditor, by a de debtor without P having the authority of D, the debtor, to do so. If D's obligation to C is discharged by the pursuer's action, one can say that D is enriched by the saving of no longer having to perform his obligation to the creditor. This enrichment is at the pursuer's expense. So you can see that the pursuer has an enrichment claim against the debtor. For example, in Reed versus Lord Riven, 1918, Lord R. Riven was indebted to a bank. 
The debts were guaranteed by K, whose own debts in turn were guaranteed by Mr. R. On K's death, the bank found that his assets were not enough to cover Lord R's debt. Mr. R paid the balance to the bank, which as a result treated Lord R's Riven's debt as discharged. Lord Riven was therefore enriched because he was no longer liable to pay the bank. Lord Driven had made a saving at Mr. R's expense, and Lord Driven was therefore held liable to pay Mr. R the amount of the saving. Again, in Lawrence Building Company against Lanarkshire County Council, 1978, Lawrence Building Company built houses in Lanark, Lanark Town Council had a statutory obligation to construct sewers which would connect the houses to the existing system of public sewers. The work of building the sewers was carried out by the company, the building company itself, LBC. LBC expected the local authority, Lanark Town Council, to pay for the sewers. However, after local government reorganisation in Scotland in 1975, LTC was replaced by Strathclyde, Lanark County Council, um, and then Strathclyde Regional Council, which refused actually to pay for the sewers. Lanark County Council, the local authority, was found to be enriched by savings which had made in not having to construct the sewers, despite its statutory obligation to do so, and therefore the building company had a claim for unjustified enrichment against the local authority. Now, different remedies may be required in enrichment law. In some cases, restoration of the specific thing will be required, for example, money or goods, but improvement services and the use of property cannot be restored as such. Therefore, the services required to be valued and then paid for. Where goods have been consumed or passed on to others, they cannot be returned as they were received. Again, where a debt or obligation has been paid or performed by a third party, it too cannot be returned as such. Now, the courts draw a distinction between the way in which the enrichment comes about. An enrichment may come about by transfer, the impoverished person delivers the enriching subject, matter, money, corporeal property to the enriched person, the defender, the defender consents by receiving them rather than by refusing the transfer. Secondly, there could be an imposed enrichment, the pursuer is enriched by the defender by an act other than the transfer of the enriching subject matter and without the defender's consent or authorization to do so. For example, the pursuer improves the defender's property or the pursuer pays the defender's debt to a third party. Enrichment, thirdly, enrichment by taking. The defender enriches himself by way of the use of the pursuer's property or other right without the pursuer's consent or authorization. Now, there's got to be loss and causation. To be returnable, an enrichment must be gained at the expense of somebody else. Usually, another person must have suffered a loss or diminution of wealth which results in the other's enrichment. The role of loss in enrichment cases is to help in identifying where there is a right to recover and who has such a right? Now, the enrichment must not be an incidental or chance outcome of the pursuer's expenditure. For example, if the pursuer does something for his own benefit, which also incidentally confers a benefit on another, the former often suffers no relevant loss in that the latter's benefit didn't cause him any extra expenditure. Now, in Edinburgh District Tramways against Courtney, it was decided in 1909, 
the Lord President Dunedin, one of the famous Scottish judges of the, um, of the 20th century, stated that if one man heats his house by reason of which his neighbour's house is heated, the former cannot recover the cost of the coal via v the neighbour whose house is actually benefited incidentally from the pursuers heating his house. Now in this case, the Edinburgh uh, District Tramways case, Edinburgh District tram Tramways ran trams in Edinburgh. C contracted with EDT to provide fittings on the trams for which boards would be hung, from which boards would be hung to carry adverts. EDT, Edinburgh District Tramways, acquired new trams from which boards were already provided to improve safety and decency. Therefore C no longer had to incur the expense of providing the fittings. However, C continued to charge EDT the same rate for its services. EDT argued that C, by making a saving in this way, was enriched. It was held that C was only, only incidentally benefited by expenditure which EDT had engaged upon for their own purposes, that is, for safety and decency. No claim, therefore, lay against the defenders. Now, the mere fact that the pursuer carried out expenditure with a view only to his own interest does not always preclude recovery altogether. For example, if I improve land in the honest but at the same time mistaken belief that land is mine, I am acting for my own benefit. However, this will not preclude me from recovering for the enrichment of the true owner. And that was decided in Newton against Newton in 1925. Recovery has also been allowed in cases where the pursuer has acted in his own interest and partly for that of the defender. The purpose of the expenditure, therefore, is simply a factor which requires to be taken into account in considering whether or not the resultant enrichment is at the expense of the pursuer. However, a more important factor is likely to be the directness with which the enrichment which is created for the defender by way of the pursuer's activity. Now, a number of cases have concerned a situation which has been described as indirect enrichment, where three or more parties are involved in what is called an enrichment chain or triangle. Here, A confers a benefit on C as a result of a, contract, a transaction, often a contract, between A and B. In general, A will not be allowed to recover against C in such a situation. For example, if A is a building subcontractor who performs work under the subcontract of B, thereby benefiting C, the building owner, but A is not paid by B because B has become insolvent. A doesn't have an enrichment claim against C for the work done. And this was decided in J.B. Mackenzie, Edinburgh against Lord Advocate, 1972. This is because the law holds that A, in entering the subcontract, relied only on the credit of the other contracting party and therefore bears the risk of B's insolvency. A, therefore, is limited to his contractual claim against B. Similarly, there are a number of garage repair cases where A is the repairer of C's damaged car, but is actually performing the repair under a contract, not with C, but rather with his insurers, B. If B becomes insolvent before paying A, a has no claim against C for the enrichment which arises from the repair. He's actually repaired C's car. And this was decided in Kirkland's garage against Clark. That was decided in 1967. However, in some cases of an indirect enrichment, recovery will be allowed because, the policy, because of policy factors favouring recovery. For example, an MI 
in Instrument Engineers Limited against Versada and Beetle, Beatty, sorry, 1991, V defrauded M and I of £50,000. Next day, V used £41,240 of the cash to buy a house in Dumfries in the name of his mistress, B. V was arrested, convicted and jailed for fraud. M and I were held unable to recover the 50000 from V. M and I then sought restitution from B. It was held although B was only indirectly, uh, only indirectly a, an indirect sorry, beneficiary of the fraud in question, it was held that no person should be entitled to profit from the fraud of another and therefore B should, be, should repay the sum sought to M and I. However, it's almost impossible to lay down general rules as to the circumstances when indirect en enrichment claim will be allowed. Now, sometimes the law allows uh, an enrichment recovery although there is no loss being su sustained. Some, situ some situations arise where, where trustees, agents, etc. are liable to hand over to those to whom the the, 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 their duties are owed, even though there is no correspondence lo corresponding loss to creditors. Now, before an enrichment can be reversed or paid for, its retention by the enriched person must be unjustified, and this is an important point. As a corollary to this, the enriched person will be able to retain the enrichment if the enrichment is justified. In short, an enrichment is justified where there is a legal ground for the retention of the enrichment. Now, two examples of a situation where an enrichment is justified are where the, the enrichment was a result of an unconditional gift or donation or the performance of a valid and subsisting contract. These are, however, not the only circumstances where an enrichment can be said to be justified. One can really only ascertain whether an enrichment is unjustified by looking at the way in which the defender has been enriched. As far as transfers are concerned, a transfer takes place when an asset such as money or goods has been transferred to the rich person. In Shilladay against Smith, Lord Rogers stated that the cases where recovery has been allowed by the courts often correspond with the typology of the Roman law prediction is. However, the modern law is not confined to the situations which are defined by the prediction is. Now, let's look at the condictio in deputy, and this means an action for recovery of an undue and indebitant transfer. The transfer falls to be reversed because it was not legally due to be made in the first place. However, the law has restricted the breadth of this concept because the application would mean that all gifts were reversible, which would be unjust. The typical condictio in deputy in Scots law is where the, trans the transfer has made an undue transfer in question as a result of an error that was due by the transfer of, an error on the part of the transferor, because of some legal obligation owed to the transferee or the recipient. An error on the part of the transferor is often said to be a condition precedent to a finding that the transfer is undue and so reversible. Now, whereas the courts have taken a fairly wide approach as to what ranks as an error which would allow a claim to recovery, um, not every error would permit such a claim. Now, examples of such an error would include the following circumstances. One, a transfers money or goods to B, meaning to pay or transfer to C, or A transfers more money or goods to B than he owes to B. The latter is liable to restore the money or the goods to A because A was an error 
as to his liability, the extent of his obligation to be. Secondly, the error may be in fact, i.e., for, exa for example, as to the identity of the person to whom A is making a transfer or the quantity due to be transferred under, for example, a contract. Or, thirdly, the error may be in law. For example, the power of a local authority to borrow money under legislation. The local authority could have got the law wrong and made a payment as a consequence. Now, knowledge that a transfer is not due precludes the conducti, conductio and debiti. It is possible but not necessary that the error is shared by the transferee. The error may arise from the transferee's misrepresentation, as in Balfour versus Smith and Logan. However, fraud is not an error for the purposes of the conductive indemnity. And that was decided in GM Scott against York Trailer Limited. The transfer error need not be excusable, or, although that may be a factor to be weighed in considering the overall equities of the case. If an error is excusable, that favours re restoration to the pursuer. If the error is inexcusable, denial of recovery is more likely. Now, there are a number of cases illustrating um, these points. Paying the wrong person. The leading case here is Credit Leonese against George Stevenson and Company Limited, which was decided in 1901. You've got Credit Leonese um, remitting money to GS, the defenders by error. CL had intended to pay a company of a similar name in Glasgow the money. The error was discovered some 11, 11 months later and G argued that the money was, um, Stevenson, however, argued that the money was received in good faith by them. GS had made use of the money on that basis. It was held that GS was liable to repay CL, GS having been negligent in the way in the which they dealt with the payment. In the Bank of New York against North British Steel Group, 1992, BNY were instructed by a customer A to transfer money to another bank to the account of B. But as a result of a mistake, entering the account, numbers on the computer were erroneously transferred to the account of NBSG. NBSG, however, were already owed money by A. When BNY claimed payment, NBSG remitted only the balance beyond which the debt which they claimed from A. It was held that for BNY to recover, it would require to be shown how it had actually come to make this error. The excusability of BNY was a factor the court actually could take into account before reaching its decision. Payment may, may not be due under a contract, but again, payment is actually made. We've got here the case of the builders Peter Walker and Sons Limited against Leith Glazing, decided in 1980. PW were building contractors LG were subcontractors. PW's charge and X authorised Leith Glazing LG to perform extra work under the subcontract for which LG were paid by PW. X had no authority to authorise the work. It was held that PW were entitled to recover payment from Leith Glazing. Now, you've got another instance of where you can actually have a, a claim for unjust enrichment. It's on the principle of conductio ob turpum 
vel inducium causam. This principle was received into Scots law and enabled the recovery of transfer for an illegal or immoral purpose. So basically, the money is actually given out, used for an immoral purpose. The parties weren't allowed um, to recover um, in relation to the, if they were equally responsible, where they're equally responsible for the illegality. Now, you've got some case law on this. In Barr against Crawford, which was decided in 1982, B. Barr alleged she paid local authority members money to influence her licensing application. So basically she gives out money to councillors who are sitting on a um, licensing board. She's applying for a license. And she raised an action to actually recover the money she's actually paid out for this illegal purpose. It was held that B's corrupt intention prevented recovery of the money under the law of unjust enrichment. Now, again, enrichment by transfer can be reversed if the money is transferred for a purpose which fails to materialise. The underlying idea here is that the transferor has made a payment or other transfer on the basis of some anticipated return which is now not going to occur. The transferee has therefore no legal justification for retaining the money or other property which has been transferred. The classic case referred to by the institutional writers is the giving of an engagement rings. The, 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 the rings are actually given by each um, member to the um, each party to the forthcoming marriage. And if the engagement is broken, broken off, however, and the marriage doesn't take place, then the rings have got to be returned. Similarly, wedding presents which are purchased in advance would require to be returned. Med many modern cases on what's called the Condictio Cosa Data Cosa Non Secuta, or CCDCNS, centre on arrangements between men and women cohabiting and planning with varying degrees of enthusiasm to marry. Now, in Shilladay against Smith, 1998, M and W began to live together in M's cottage. In 1998, they engaged in 1990, they never married. In 1988, M had bought a house in a state of disrepair, and from about 1990, M and W began to improve this property in which they moved into in 1991. The works were completed in 1992 when M ejected W from the house. This is a case we've looked at before. W had spent about, nine, you'll recall, 9,600 on the works, 7,000 to tradesmen, 1,800 to M to pay for materials, and 756 on items to the garden left behind after ejection, her ejection. It was held that W was entitled to the repetition of 1,800 pounds the return of it she had paid on the basis of this particular principle, CCDN, CCD, CNS. That's to say that she'd made payments in contemplation of a marriage which did not take place. Similarly, she was entitled to recompense for what she had expended on tradesmen and other items, the benefit of which was now being enjoyed by M. Lord Roger stated the duty to restore is based not on agreement, but on the natural ground, i.e. the duty imposed by law, this unilateral obligation.
Now, however, Shelley should be contrasted with Grieve against Morrison, which was decided in 1993. G and M decided to live together on the understanding they would marry G when his first marriage was terminated by divorce. M bought a flat in which the parties lived. The mortgage, the so-called mortgage, was paid by M. Later, this flat was sold and another was purchased on the same basis as the first. G contributed work and money to the cost of renovations. The parties fixed their wedding for August 18, 1984 and in 1983 jointly purchased another flat with a joint loan and the free pro proceeds of the sale of M's previous flat. However, G always had considerable but at the same time unexpressed reservations about the wedding. He only advised M about this one month after they had moved into the new flat. G then left the property. G brought an action for a division of sale of the flat. M argued on the basis of CCDNS that she was entitled to G's share of the property as opposed to any part of the free proceeds of, proceeds of sale of the property because the arrangements which had been made on the basis that the parties would marry never really um, materialised. It was held that M had no such claim to G's share and for her to have any claim even to the process of, of sale of the property beyond half, she would have to show that firstly, the arrangements would be made on the basis of mutually agreed understanding that there was either express implied from the circumstances and M had contributed to G's share of the property. In a CCD CNS case, the first question is what is the cause or reason for the transaction from the point of view of the transfer? One should not consider whether the parties had agreed or understood that the transfer would fall to be reversed if a particular event didn't occur. However, it's also necessary for the pursuer to prove that the defender had knowledge of the relevant purpose or cause. Whereas there is no need for the action under CCDNS to succeed, but there is a contract between the parties, a number of CCDNS cases have had a contractual background. For example, in Watson and Shankland in 1871, a shipping case this concerned the recovery of payment which had been made in advance of freight for the carriage of goods at sea. The ship had sunk during its voyage without fault on the part of the master and crew. The advance was held to be recoverable. Now, in Cantia San Rocco against Clyde Shipbuilding Company Limited, 1923, an Austrian sea, an Austrian company, ordered marine engines for a price of £11,500 from CS. C made an initial payment of £2,300. War broke out. The contract was frustrated by the supervening illegality arising from C being an alien company. After the war ended in 1918, C, now an Italian company, successfully brought a sort of repayment of the advance payment on the ground that the performance had not been met by the counter-performance from Clyde. This was held to be an instance of CCD CNS. Cantier extends the law since the payment for which Cantier had made was, in effect, an instalment of the full price which was due under the contract. The House of Lords made it clear that CCDNS principle was not limited to advances but applied to all cases where a contractual performance hadn't been met by its corresponding counter performance from another party. Now, we next look, look at what's called conductio sine causa, the action for a return of payment where the transfer has no legal basis. Now, this can arise from what's called compulsion. 
The Scottish courts have recognised that transfers which are made under unlawful compulsion from the transferee may, may give rise to claims for a reversal of those transfers. For example, in British Oxygen, Oxygen against the South of Scotland Electricity Board, which was decided in 1959, the SSEB supplied British Oxygen with electricity at high voltage. The supply cost less to provide than a low voltage one, but in breach of the relevant statute, tariff charges were applied by SSEB didn't differentiate properly between high and low voltage customers. Therefore, British Oxygen ended up paying too much. However, British Oxygen was under no error about it. British Oxygen pro protested about it, but was told by SACB that if the former didn't pay, its electricity supply would be cut off. British Oxygen raised an action to recover the overpayments. However, since SACB was the only available electricity supplier, British Oxygen was therefore paying under compulsion and therefore could recover. Now, it's not sufficient to succeed in an action for unjustified enrichment that a payment is made to be under protest by A. Probably this is not sufficient to allow A to recover B payment from B. B must be aware of the definite reservation of rights. Now we also look now at ultra-virus demands by public authority. It may be that a payment is made to a public authority <coughs> acting under statutory powers. The mere fact that the legislation doesn't justify the payment suffices for recovery. <coughs> for example, in Woolwich Building Society against Inland Revenue in 1993, W made three payments totaling £57 to the Inland Revenue in response to a tax demand which was made under the Income Tax Building Society Regulations of 1986. W disputed the validity of the regulations but made the payments because it feared penalties and adverse publicity if it did not. The House of Lords held that W was entitled to restitution of its payment. The case is important in that the money hadn't been paid by way of mis mistake W, however, believed that the demand was unlawful. Now, we now look at what's called impositions. The condicto, condictio indebiti and other conditions don't apply to imposed enrichments, such as the unauthorised improvement of another's property or performance of another's obligation. Scots law has created a number of conditions which require to be satisfied before an enrichment can be successful. The impoverished person must have been acting, must have been in good faith possession of the property while carrying out the improvement, that is, without knowledge of his lack of right to possession. If the possession is in bad faith, that is, with the knowledge of the lack of the right to have possession. There is no recovery, except perhaps for necessary repairs and maintenance. In Duffross against Kippen, <coughs> A, a partner A in a firm AB, spent £234 improving its business premises, believing they belonged to AB. In fact, the premises belonged to somebody else, and T, the other partner in the firm, B, was merely, a was, was merely a tenant of the premises. It's held that the owner of the premises was liable to reimburse £234 to A. Error doesn't seem to be 
as important a role in cases of enrichment by an unauthorised performance of another's obligation, especially where the performance is the payment of money. What matters is whether or not the debt is discharged and if the creditor treats the payment as being so discharged. In that case, the debtor would be liable. Now, any enrichment, we now look at what's called takings. Any enrichment which one acquires by exercising someone else's property rights without that other person's authority is unjustified. That which is pr protected may extend further than the protection of property rights. For example, it may include an enrichment which is acquired under a fiduciary relationship, such as that of a trustee via the beneficiary. A fiduciary such as a trustee may only act in the interest of a beneficiary and not in their own interest. In Teacher Against Calder in 1899, T loaned £15,000 to C for investment in C's timber business in return for interest and half a share in the net profits of that business. In breach of the contract, however, C used the money for other purposes, making a substantial profit as a result. He was able to pay T with the interest and half a share of the timber profits over the period of the advance. It was held that T wasn't entitled to claim, uh, to, to claim the gain which C had made from the breach of contract since their relationship was not fiduciary. There wasn't a relationship of trust between them. Now this case should be contrasted with that of AG against Blake, the Attorney General against Blake which was decided in 2001. Here, Blake was a member of the British Intelligence Service, MI5, who betrayed his country and fled to the Soviet Union. His memoirs were sub subsequently published in the UK and made a substantial profit. The government successfully sought to prevent these profits from being transferred to Blake on the basis that the publication was in breach of B's lifelong contractual obligation to keep his secret activities, uh, secret agent activities, secret. The action succeeded. The relationship between the Blake and the government wasn't fiduciary, but very close to it. Perhaps enrichment should be seen as unjustified, not only when it arises from misuse of another's property, but also when it arises from wrongdoing of some kind which is recognised by other branches of the law, such as contract and fiduciary obligations. Now, there are a number of defences which actually apply in relation to unjustified enrichment. First one is equity. The court may take account of the relationship between the parties before deciding to order the restoration of or payment for enrichment. In short, the court may decide that notwithstanding the fact that a case of unjustified enrichment has been made out, the enrichment should stay where it is. In Varney against the Borough of Lanark, which was decided in 1984, 1974, sorry, it was held inequitable to allow a builder to recover for the sewers it had installed for the Defender Local Authority because the parties had been in dispute about liability to perform this act and the builder had available at the time of the remedy in the form of an action for the implement of a statutory duty is an alternative remedy. <coughs> now, a party is actually spent, consumed, or otherwise disposed of enrichment and is no longer enriched, <coughs> may escape liability to restore or pay it in whole or in part. In the credit line is against George Stevenson case 1901, which was looked at uh, previously. It was held that for D to raise the defence, um, 
D was required to show that D had reasonable grounds for believing that the money was theirs, uh, and having that reasonable belief, D acted in such a way as to alter their position and make repetition unjust. However, the defence is inapplicable if the defender negligently, uh, if the, sorry, if the defender is negligent. Now, finally, briefly, as far as remedies are concerned, in Shilladay against Smith, Lord Roger emphasised that the three R's of Scots law, repetition, restitution, um, and re recompense as remedy. Repetition is the remedy for the return of money, restitution that for the return of corporeal property, and finally recompense the remedy for other forms of enrichment. Thank you.